My name is Tara Whedon, and I am the Curriculum and Learning Design Manager here at Edgeforia, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. I am joined by our host, Eric M. Francis. Um, Eric is an international author, educator, and presenter with more than 25 years of experience in education as a classroom teacher, site administrator, education program specialist at a state education agency, and staff development trainer. He is consistently ranked as one of the world top 30 education professionals by the International Research Organization Global Gurus. Eric provides professional development on establishing rigorous learning environments and delivering educational experiences that challenge students to demonstrate different levels of thinking and use their depth of knowledge in different contexts. His areas of expertise include good questioning and inquiry, teaching and learning for depth of knowledge, tiered instruction, authentic learning, differentiated instruction, personalized learning, standards-based grading and learning, and talent development. So I'm sure many of those things apply where you are at. Um, Eric has already dropped some information that I'll share in the chat um, with you all for contacting him. Um, and so we're so excited. Without further ado, Eric, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. Um, add anything else you'd like to introduce yourself and go ahead and start sharing with our guests. We're so excited to have you. Well, again, thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Eric Francis, and as Tara told you, I'm an author, educator, and presenter. I'm broadcasting you live from Scottsdale, Arizona. I've been an educator again for over almost 30 years now, which is amazing to think. And um, again, I'm an author. My first book was called Now That's a Good Question. It's how you turn your standards into good questions that uh, challenge students to think deeply and also uh, understand and use your depth of knowledge. And this is actually my second book. It's called Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge. Now, depth of knowledge has been a focus and priority in education for about the last 10 years is when we all went to what we call college and career readiness standards. You in Texas, you call them the TEKS. You have your own individual standards, but they're still known for their cognitive rigor and college and career readiness. Well, one of the things that mark and measure the rigor or cognitive rigor of these standards is that they expect students to demonstrate different levels of thinking according to Bloom's taxonomy and understand and use their depth of knowledge according to the DOK levels developed by Dr. Norman Webb. However, what if I told you that most of the information that's been presented on DOK as a concept and framework has been completely inaccurate? That's what we are going to talk about today. We are going to talk about today about what exactly DOK is, how the DOK levels can be used accurately and appropriately to plan and provide teaching and learning experiences that are standards-based, socially, emotionally supportive, and student responsive. And most importantly, how DOK can become the method and model for teaching in the future. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. I put some links in there. You can contact me at my webpage. It's there. Also my Twitter handle. Please follow me on Twitter at Maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, edu12 that's the name of my company maverick education there's no c in maverick it's after my name my daughter's names madison avery and amanda and yes i am a child of the 80s so my favorite movie is top gun and i'm not just jumping on the bandwagon when everyone jumped off uh, the bandwagon when tom cruise jumped the couch i still was on it so uh and also there's a link there at the bottom uh it says www.tinyurl.com slash dok eduphoria if you go there, you will be able to download some uh, slides I have here that you guys can go and turn into posters and share with your teachers. Um, because the thing is this, the unfortunate thing is that much of what's out there on DOK is inaccurate. And it's because of, whoops, this graphic right here. How many of you have ever seen this graphic before? Maybe you received it as part of your training on standards. Maybe you've received it as part of your work with standards and assessments. This is the DOK wheel. This wheel is unfortunately completely inaccurate. It was given out as part of the distribution of the college and career readiness standards trainings that happened um, across the country. Of course, Texas is not one of the standards, one of the states that uh, adopted these, uh, I'm not gonna say the word because I know in Texas, we're not supposed to call it uh, the standards are, but these uh, national college and career ready standards. But 
this document that was given about out there is completely inaccurate. Let me prove, show you my evidence on this. First of all, do you see the URL address at the bottom of this poster? Well, if you go to the link there at the bottom of this poster and URL address, it will take you to a dead link. In fact, if we go to that link right now, it would take us to this page. Now, Dr. Norman Webb did work for the Wisconsin Center of Education Research. That's where he came up with the concept of depth of knowledge as a criterion for alignment studies. What if I told you it was never meant to be a method and model for teaching and learning? It actually started out as a criterion for alignment studies. You would take your standards and you would code them as a one, two, three, and four, and you would take your curricular activities and assessment items and code them as a one, two, three, or four, and then compare them each other, to each other for their degree of alignment or what he called DOK consistency. But this is not the right, correct URL address for the web alignment tool. The correct URL address is this, and that will take us to this page. Now, this page is still active. The standards on there date the college and career readiness movement of the late 2000s, but you still can use and find some valuable information on there, especially if you go to the tutorial link there. It'll explain to you what exactly depth of knowledge is in the four content areas, according to Dr. Norman Webb. Now, some of you might be looking at me a little skeptical right now. You might be saying, okay, well, URL addresses uh, change all the time. That citation still cited Dr. Norman Webb. Well, this is Dr. Norman Webb. And in an interview he did in 2013 for a blog called Cognitive Rigor to the Core by Dr. John Walkup, he said this about the DOK wheel. The only possible use of the chart I can see is if someone took a verb and placed it in the four spokes. You see, he didn't create the DOK wheel and he doesn't endorse the DOK wheel. In fact, he refutes it. If you contact him or you contact his organization, they will tell you that he does not endorse the wheel, he did not create the wheel, do not use the wheel. And Dr. Karen Hess, who came up with the concept of cognitive rigor by superimposing the DOK levels with Bloom's taxonomy into matrix form, she calls it the DOK wheel is misfortune. And she tells people in her workshops to discard it. It flies in the face of what DOK is all about. DOK is about what comes after the verb. Please give me a Y, the letter Y, or give me a yes if you've ever heard that before, that DOK is about what comes after the verb. Now, here's the, here's the thing about DOK. I first learned about it when I did my training on college and career readiness standards. And I was really fascinated by it because I always had a problem with cognitive action verbs. They're highly abstract. They have multiple meanings. When you go look into taxonomy such as Bloom's, that verb will not only have so many multiple verbs if it's one of the six, cat five, six categories in Bloom's, but it also can appear in multiple levels within these taxonomies. So I always had a problem with it. But the thing is, when we were I was given that wheel, I questioned it and I said, if depth of knowledge is not about the verb, then why is this all come after the verb? Why is this wheel all about the verbs? So I did a lot of investigating over the last few years. I got to meet Karen Hess. I got to talk to John Walker and Ben Jones, who wrote her rigor papers with her. I even got to talk to Norman Webb. And for the last 10 years, I've been out there trying to tell people that the DOK wheel is inaccurate. The story behind it is this. Florida was one of the first states to use DOK as its criterion for alignment studies. They didn't use Bloom's taxonomy. Someone, some teacher in Florida, uploaded that wheel to the internet and said, this is depth of knowledge. And when 46 states adopted the college and career readiness standards that became the national standards of the United States, not Texas, one of the states that led the training and curriculum development for those standards was New York State. And New York State found that wheel on the internet, made that poster we just saw, maybe a poster you have, and also produced a video on it. Now, I knew this was 99% of the story. I knew this was the truth behind it. But this summer, I was confirmed that this was the truth. I was doing a keynote at Confortu for the University of Connecticut, which is Joe Renzoli's gifted program, if anyone knows from the gifted area, Dr. Joseph Renzoli. 
And I was presenting the story about how DOK, the DOK wheel is inaccurate, how it came from New York. Someone in the chat put this little message in there for me. It said this. I want you to know that New York realized this mistake and invited Karen Hess and we at central office were told to go into the field and correct it. So New York actually put out there this wheel, knew it was inaccurate and then tried to fix it. But it was too late. The sand was out of the bag. And basically this wheel has been out there. And I really believe this wheel has harmed a lot of things when it comes to education. So unfortunately, the message I have there is this to you. You've been bamboozled. You've been bamboozled when it comes to DOK wheel. My goal for you at the end of this training today is for you to go and destroy that wheel, throw it out, throw it away. I know we're all making a return to rigor right now, but please do not take out that DOK wheel to make your academic instruction and your assessments more rigorous. So what's the problem with the wheel? Well, remember what doctor, what I told you is that depth of knowledge is not about the verb. It's about what comes after the verb. Tara, thank you very much for fixing the link there as well. Well, if you look at the wheel, what do you see in there? Verbs. So depth of knowledge is not about the verb. Then why is this wheel full of verbs? The other reason why Dr. Norman Webb created depth of knowledge is because Taxonomies such as Bloom's or Marzano's or the Solo Taxonomy or Fink's Taxonomy of Significant uh, Learning, they consist of multiple verbs in multiple sections. Here's the thing. If you look at the DOK wheel, what do you see? The same verb in different sections. So if you're identifying, are you identifying a DOK1 or DOK2? If you are constructing, are you constructing it a DOK2 or DOK3? How about use? You could use at a DOK one, two, and three. So again, when you see this image, this is also why it's inaccurate. Not only does it not represent what DOK is, but it also inaccurately represents how the, le the levels measure different types and extent of learning. Now, some of you may think, well, this is just another way to do blooms. And you're absolutely correct. It is a just another way to do blooms. In fact, what if I told you that the DOK wheel is actually based upon the Bloom's Hot Wheel that was introduced by Dr. Barbara Clark, if you can see this book here. Let me see if I can bring up a little bit of the image a little bit better. My graphics might that great here. This is Growing Up Gifted by Dr. Barbara Clark. And if you turn to pay in the book, you will find Oh, sorry about that. Let me see if we can miss there. I'm showing you the page with the DOK wheel in it. So it's actually in this book. So if you ever thought the DOK wheel was just another way to do blooms, you're absolutely correct. But it's not depth of knowledge. That's why we need to do this. We all need to put on our affinity gauntlets and snap that thing out of existence. If you have any questions right now, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'm reading the chat as I present here and I wanna be sure I'm responsive with it. So if you have any questions, just put it in the chat and uh, I'll keep on going until I see some questions there. I'll actually stop this so you can answer, ask her some questions. So what exactly is depth of knowledge? Well, first of all, let's get this out of the way. It's not a taxonomy. It does not scaffold. It, you do not have to start at a DOK one to get to a DOK four. Depth of knowledge describes four different ways students can understand and use their knowledge and thinking or learning in different contexts and deeper ways. These are the descriptors that Dr. Norman Webb came up with. At a DOK1, you're recalling and reproducing information. At a DOK2, you're applying knowledge, concepts, and skills, or using basic reasoning. At a DOK3, you're either thinking strategically or using complex reasoning and planning. And at DOK4, you're thinking extensively. Now, teaching and testing for depth of knowledge starts and stops with the standard. And I want to make sure that's very clear. Teaching and testing for depth of knowledge starts and stops 
with the standard, teaching and testing. The DOK level of a standard establishes the ceiling of assessment on a standardized assessment. Standardized assessments will not assess student learning beyond the DOK level of the standard, unless it's math assessments. They get away with that because they use the standards of mathematical practices. That's why sometimes in the TEKS, you may see a DOK1 standard, but you may have a DOK3 item. The other thing I want to assure you about is this. There are no DOK4s items or activities or tasks on a standardized assessment. It takes too much time, it takes too much effort, and it takes too, it's too extensive. Writing assessments may be DOK4, especially if they have to synthesize multiple texts, but standardized assessments will not have items that assess beyond a DOK3. But the DOK level of the standard, that sets the ceiling of the assessment. And again, assessments won't have items that assess beyond the DOK level of the standard because that would make the assessment unfair. They also won't only assess at the DOK level of the standard because that would make the test too difficult. It assesses over a range of DOK levels. So if I have a standard that's a DOK2, I know I'm going to have items on there that's either going to be a DOK1 or a DOK2. If I have a standard up there that is a DOK3, I know I'm going to have items that are either going to be a DOK1, DOK2, DOK3. That's an assessment. Tests assess at the DOK level of the standards. Assessments assess over a range of DOK levels to determine where students are in their learning. Now, as I told you, Norman Webb created DOK as a criterion for alignment studies. Karen Hess turned it into a measure of cognitive rigor. I made it into a method and model for teaching and learning. So what I did was I took and made an essential question that needs to be addressed and assessed at every DOK level. And also I created some descriptors that showed how students can demonstrate and communicate their learning concretely, specifically met and using a measurable and observable uh, criteria. So at a DOK one, you're asking the kids, what is the knowledge? These are the questions that I ask who, what, where, and when. All they have to do is recall information or recall how to, to answer correctly. At a DOK2, you are asking the students how and why can the knowledge or skill be used. Now students have to apply their knowledge concepts and skills or use the information and basic reasoning to establish and explain their answers with examples. What you want here is not just for students to attain answers or give you answers. They have to explain how they attained it. This is not show your work. This is you comprehending and communicating how you got the answers you did. At a DOK3, you're asking how and why could the knowledge be understood and used. Now the students have to think strategically or use complex reasoning to examine and explain with evidence. If you want to do a DOK3 every single time, give the kids the answer and ask them, why is it correct or incorrect? In English language arts, stop asking, what is a central idea or theme? For two reasons. Number one, the standardized assessments don't ask students to come up with the central idea and theme. They have the correct answer right there with three different distractors. Number two, it's also a, and it's supposed to be a subjective question, but it's actually an objective question. Because if you ask me what's a central idea or theme, I can say to you, do you want what I think, what you taught me, or what this book says? But if you give the kids a central idea and theme and ask them how the text strengthens and supports it, now they're using evidentiary thinking and reasoning, and you're also preparing them for how they have to address those items on an assessment. Because assessments, especially standardized assessments, they always have that question, which is this, what's the central idea and theme? And you have the, the one, correct answer, that's hidden between the three distractors. And I call that the Vegas question because you got a one out of four chance to get it correct. But the question that the kids all trip up is when they say which part of the text addresses and supports the central idea and theme. That's where they trip up or get wrong. So what I'm going to suggesting to you is this, give the kids the answer and ask them, why is it correct or incorrect? 
And a DLK4 asks what else could be done with the knowledge. This is where the students are going to go deep within a subject area or across the curriculum or among texts and topics or beyond the classroom. This is where kids are getting not only into um, knowledge augmentation, but also knowledge creation. These are more extensive. It's not project-based learning. Project-based learning can happen at all DLK levels. This is more where it's more of a more of a extended learning experience. Now, I told you I told, turned DOK into a method of model for teaching and learning. Teaching and testing starts and stops at the standard. That's where your instruction begins. But teaching and learning begins at the DOK level where students are. That is how you're providing not only instruction, but also intervention. What you do is you start at the DOK level of the standard and you tier your instruction to the DOK level where students are, but you just don't stay there. You have to build them back up to, through, and beyond the DOK level, the standard. That's why the arrows look the way they do there. So teaching and testing starts and stops at the standard, but teaching and learning, you tier to where they are and you find their strengths so they can rise to, reach, and go beyond that DOK bar set by the standard. This turns DOK not only into a strength finder to address deficits in learning, it also transforms DOK into a multi-tiered system support, so specifically an RTI model. Each DOK level functions as its own RTI. And I use the inverted RTI that was developed by um, Austin Bufferman and Mike Mattos where it's an inverted pyramid. You're not doing this for identification sake, which is the right side up pyramid. You are doing it as an inverted pyramid because you're tiering your instruction to where the students are. You're being student responsive and then you're build, finding their strengths so they can rise to reach and go beyond that bar. So when you have the DOK levels, again, each DOK level is its own RTI. The standard sets the instructional focus and the criteria for demonstrating proficiency. You treat that like a finish line. You start with the end in mind. Show the kids what the standard is that they have to achieve. If they can't reach that finish line, and we have to believe that all kids can reach that finish line, you need to tier your instructions to where you are. they are. That's the right side of the block. So if you notice, it starts at the standard and you have the diamonds there, because your teaching is always going reduced, deeper, reduced, deeper, reduced, deeper. You're always starting with the standard, tearing it to where they are, and bringing them back and beyond that bar. The left side is how the student experiences it. The student experiences DOK teaching and learning at their level, but we as teachers guide and support them to go to, through, and beyond the DOK level. So let me give you an example of how this works here. I do this a lot with a math standard. There's a math standard in high school. It's a DOK3 because they have to use complex reasoning supported by evidence to explain why the sum and product of a rational number is, irrash is rational. The sum of a rational number and irrational number is irrational. And the product of a non-zero rational number and irrational number is irrational. I ask my students, can anyone do that right now? Most likely they can't. So again, I have to tier the instruction to where they are. Can anyone tell me what a rational number is or an irrational number? Now they learned this back in middle school. This is a high school standard. They learned this back in middle school. So again, I'm tiering it down. I'm tiering to probably about a tier two because I'm talking about using subject specific terminology. Then I ask them, what does rational or rational mean? Now, again, I'm still in tier two because, again, I'm trying to through that baseline knowledge. Now I ask them, what is a non-zero number? That's tier three, because now I've tiered it all the way back down to kindergarten. That's where they learned what a non-zero number was. And hopefully someone will tell me any number that's not zero. I say, good, let's start there. What is an example of a number that's not zero? And now tell me the number, hopefully correctly. That's a DOK too, because when you give examples, that's a DOK too. So I go around the room, we establish the rules of what 
um, numbers can do, what we can do with numbers. We say we can do the properties of operations. We can count it, measure it, and find out a number line. My DLK3 question is, what if I put a negative sign in front of your number? Would it be rational or irrational and why? That's now I'm at a DLK3. So again, I'm tiering my instruction to where they are, and I'm going to build them back up to that bar. That's how DLK can serve as an RTI. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat box there. The other thing about DOK, I say the rigor is in the response. DOK provides four different ways students could comprehend and communicate their learning. And then this is a grid actually that's in my book, Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge, which you see over actually on this side, over my shoulder here. Your teacher expectation is this, at a DOK one, they have to answer correctly. And the student goal is to answer it. At a DLK2, you have to establish and explain with answers with examples and use what you're learning to explain it. At a DLK3, you're examining, explaining with evidence and using to prove it. At a DLK4, you're exploring, explaining with examples and evidence over an extended period. Now, time is not a factor of DLK. That's difficulty. DLK is not about level of difficulty. It's about level of demand. The two questions I want you to think about with DOK is what exactly must students learn and how deeply must students understand and use their learning? The student goal is to connect and extend it, or what I like to say, go for it. So in this grid, as you notice here, it says the first column, it tells you what the teacher expectation is. This is more the teacher language. The second column is how you can use the language of DOK with your students. Mr. Francis, what do I need to do here? Just answer it. Mr. Francis, how come I didn't get full credit? Because all you did was answer it. I need you to use it to explain it. Okay, everyone, here's some answers. Some are correct, some are not correct. Use it to prove it. And in this extended learning experience, I want you to connect and extend it or go for it. Show me what you could do with what you've learned. Again, that's how the rigors and the response. And that will also help you define what the specific mental processing or what I call the DOK skill. At a DOK one, all you have to do is recall information or recall how to. At a DOK two, you're applying knowledge, concepts, and skills, or you're using information basic reasoning. Depends upon the content area. If it's more of a procedural content, then you'll be doing recall how to or apply knowledge, concepts, and skills. If it's more informational or text bound, you would basically have it as recall information or use information basic reasoning. At a DOK three, you're either thinking strategically or using the complex reasoning supported by evidence. And at DOK4, you're using either, you're either thinking extensively or using extended reasoning supported by expertise. I also want you to think of this tool here, this resource here, as a resource for coaching and support. DOK is not meant to be a, a tool for evaluation of teachers. And I'll be talking about that in a bit. You also use this tool to go and look at your items. These are sample items by uh, Robert Kaplinsky, who does a great job. He's created a bunch of different sample items out there to show you what DOK items look like. So what you would do here is this, you would look at the item and ask yourself, okay, so what exactly must the students learn and how deeply must the students understand and use their learning? What you're gonna ask yourself is, what exactly and how deeply must the students respond? So here's an example of K through five items. Notice the difference between the items. The first row, all they have to do is answer correctly. But in the second row, those items require students to establish and explain their answers with examples. In fact, that's how you can always turn a DOK1 into a DOK2. If they just have to answer correctly, that's a DOK1. But challenging them to establish and explain how they got their answers, that's a DOK2. The item is the example. Your math items in your textbook, that's the example. Your text you're reading for ELA, that's your example. They have to establish and explain how they attain their answers with those examples. And a DOK3, they have to examine, explain with evidence. So in those last items, they have to prove it. So this is an example of what K through five items look like. These are what six through eight items look like. Notice that they're not about difficulty. They're about demand what exactly and how deeply must students understand and use their learning. And this is high school. I have these. If you're interested, you can email me at eric, E-R-I-K, 
at mavericeducation.com. I can send you copies of these slides that you can turn into posters. Um, and I can also upload it into the Dropbox and give you a link on that. Now in English language arts, what you're doing here is this, at a DLK1, your items, your assessment items are just gonna to have to be answered correctly. This is where the kids are gonna be doing defining academic words or describing subject specific terms or recalling restating data in details or describing who, what, where, and when, how and why according to a text, just basic recall items. But a DLK2, now they're gonna to have to establish and explain their answers with examples of how the author, how literary elements development or how the literary elements are used by a text and author. This is also where they're gonna go and express their opinions and also do more deeper dives into craft and structure, how it's used. Now to DLK3, it's all about evidence. It's all about proving it. It's about citing textual evidence when you draw the, that supports your inferences. It's about not only determining explicit and implicit themes, but how they develop and how the text train supports it. It's about evaluating the author's choices. It's also about delving into argumentation. At a DOK2, it's about opinion, it's about feeling. At a DOK3, it's about argumentation. And at DOK4, the distinct thing about DOK4 is when you get a real extensive study. This is when you're doing author studies or genre studies. If you have literary texts and they're all bound by an essential question, or they have all these texts that use, express a similar idea or use a specific craft and structure, ask the kids how the all the all this uh, text in that unit address that, that's a DOK4. It's also where they're gonna be doing knowledge creation. It's also where they would be using basically their creativity to come up with new ideas about the text or topics that they're learning. So what distinguishes DOK? It's not about the cognitive action. To determine a DOK, the first thing you need to do is this. You need to look at your standards or your learning intentions or your objectives or your targets. And you need to look at all the words and phrases that follow that first verb that introduces the standard. Next, you need to go and look at the complexity of the content students are learning. How complex, not difficult, complex. How many different things are involved there? The key to DOK is about context. That's what makes DOK so different from other learning frameworks. It's not about cognition. It's not even really about content. It's about the context in which you can understand and use the cognition and content. Once you have that, then you need to look at how many objectives there are in that standard and what are their DOK levels, and also consider how extensively must students communicate their learning? Remember the rigor is the response. How extensively do they have to respond? When you are working with DOK, I want you to think of two questions to ask. What exactly and how deeply? What exactly is the content? How deeply is the context? So let's look at this together. Here you have four learning intentions. And the interesting thing about DOK is that deconstructing standards for depth of knowledge is the next step in unwrapping, unpacking standards. And I hear a collective sigh out there, Ugh, unpacking, unwrapping standards. Let's face it, when we unpack and unwrap standards, when I ask that, that means many teachers look at it this, you want us to circle the verbs and underline the nouns. That's how a lot of teachers generally look at unpacking and wrapping the standards. Those of us who maybe have a little more training or a little more expertise in this, we know why we're doing this. The verbs are supposed to be the skill and that the nouns are supposed to be the key concepts. But unfortunately, a lot of teachers that I've worked with, they look and they go, okay, all I'm doing is, again, circling verbs and underlining nouns. That's how they see it. Depth of knowledge tells them and informs them why they're doing this. Because once you do this method, which is a great method that was created by Larry Ainsworth, then you have to ask yourself, what exactly are the students thinking about? So if you notice in all these objectives here, all four of them ask them to identify. Well, what exactly are they identifying that first one? Literary elements. The second one, what exactly are they asking to identify? Literary devices. And the third and fourth one, they're both asking them to identify ideas and themes. Now, this is the next part where DOK comes in. Once I know what exactly they're thinking about or they must learn, 
then I need to look at how deeply they must learn it. That's described by all the words and phrases that follow that first verb. So when you deconstruct standards for depth of knowledge, go through the Ainsworth methods, circle your verbs, underline your nouns, then ask yourself, what exactly must the students learn? That's that noun that identifies the concept or the content. How deeply you have to highlight all those words that follow that first verb to the end mark. And then from there, then you break out your rigor as the response chart. Because that first one, what exactly are they identifying? Literary elements. How deeply? Of a text. All they have to do is answer correctly, which makes it a DOK1. Now in the second one, what exactly are they identifying? Literary devices. If they just have to identify what they are or where they are in a text, it'd be a DOK1. But because they have to identify how they are used in a text or by an author, they have to establish and explain their answers with examples from the text. That's a DOK2. And the third one, what exactly are they identifying? Ideas and themes, a little more complex. How deeply? Well, they have to be explicit and implicit. And they also have to identify how the text or author's trait supports them. To do that, it's examining, explain with evidence, and that makes it a DOK3. Now, if you notice, the last objective looks very similar. But what distinguishes it, if they have to do it with two or more texts written by the same uh, author or different authors or addressing the same topic or within the same genre, that's why it's a DOK4 because they have to explore and explain with examples and evidence. Any questions about this? Let's do the next one together. Right now, let's unpack and unwrap the standards and let's deconstruct them. What's the first verb you see in all these objectives? Write it right now in the chat box. What's the first verb you see? Create. Create. Right, Whitney, create. Right, Ortessa, right, Davina, create. Right, Dawn, create. It's the first verb, create, the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, right? But what exactly are they creating? A chronological sequence of events. That's what basically they're creating. Now we have to ask ourselves, how deeply do they have to create that chronological sequence of events? So let's look at that first one there. Create a chronological sequence of multiple events. What is it it asking them to do? Just make a list, make a timeline, list events in order, the criteria of how deeply they have to be multiple. For that, it's a DOK1 because all you have to do is answer correctly, list them in correct order. That's it. But now look at this next three objectives. Do you see that it says create and use a chronological sequence of events? If it's more than one verb, that second verb that follows the first one, that's a part of the DOK criteria determinant. So at first they're gonna create it and then they're gonna use it. So it's a two-step process and it's two different levels of thinking. If you have a standard or learning intention that has two different levels of thinking, it's a two-step process, it's probably more than a DOK one. So I know that these three objectives here are more than a DOK one, but there's another verb. Let's look at that second one. First, they're gonna create it, then they're gonna use it. How deeply they have to create and use it? Well, they're gonna to have to compare. What exactly are they comparing? Developments, how deeply that happened at the same time. To do that, they have to establish explaining those answers with examples, DOK2. It's not that they're comparing. What exactly are they comparing? Developments. How deeply? They happened at the same time. Those are the examples. They have to establish and explain the similarities and differences with them and the connections between them. But actually, let's look at the next one. The next one actually talks more about connections because what exactly and how deeply they have to correct, create and use that chronological sequence? They, first, they have to analyze. This is the third objective. They have to analyze. What exactly are they analyzing? Events and developments, that's what you're teaching and that's what they're learning. How deeply the connections among them in broader historical context. 
To do that, students have to examine, explain with evidence. That's why it's a DOK3. Now that last one, look at the verb. They have to create and use it for what purpose? Write it in the chat box there. What is the verb you see after create and use a chronological sequence? Evaluate, right. But it's not about evaluating. What exactly are they evaluating? Events and developments, because that's what we're teaching. And that's what they're learning. But how deeply those events and developments have to be historical. And the criteria is that they have to sh be shaped by unique circumstances of time, as well as broader historical context. A lot of stuff going on there. DOK4, because they have to explore and explain with examples and evidence. Now, when you have standards like this, not only does it tell you that there's more than one objective they have to achieve to demonstrate proficiency or perform successfully. Also, the verb becomes a part of the DOK criteria. But I wanted to show you something here. Watch what happens when I take away, create and use a chronological sequence of events in those last three objectives. The DOK level didn't change. You know why? Because it's not create and use a chronological sequence that determine the DOK level. What exactly are they comparing? Developments and how deeply that happened at the same time. That's what made it a DOK too. The next one, what exactly are they going to create using for? They're going to analyze what exactly? Events and developments and how deeply? Connections of the same in broader historical context. The fourth one, what exactly are they evaluating? Histor events and developments, how deeply, how those historical events and developments were shaped by unique circumstances, time and place. It's always about what comes after the verb. And even if I take that objective away, it still can be the same DOK level. So I'm gonna show you this next. Here you have a standard with basically straightforward from math. Use the structure of an expression to identify ways to rewrite it. What's the first verb you see, everybody? Please write it down in the chat box. All right, use. One word, what exactly are we using? An expression. How deeply? Well, we got to use the structure of it to identify ways to rewrite it. What are the two verbs you see in that yellow? What are the two verbs you see in that yellow? Put it in the chat box there. They're going to use the structure of it to identify and rewrite. Great, Whitney, to identify and rewrite. That tells me there's three objectives they must achieve to demonstrate proficiency. I have to deconstruct that standard, and I then have to go and separate those objectives out. So for the first one, they're going to use the structure of the expression. They're going to rewrite the express, structure of an expression, and they're going to identify ways to rewrite the expression. So what I need to then do there is I need to deconstruct those and determine their DOK levels. So let's look at this here. What exactly are they using? An expression. How deeply? Just the structure. DOK one, because you're answering correctly. The second one, they have to rewrite that structure of the expression. That's it. DOK one. But in the second one, they have to identify examples or ways to rewrite this struct the expression they have to establish and explain with examples that's a dok2 and that was that's what makes the overall standard a dok2 because the most cognitively demanding objective within the standard determines the overall dok level it's not that dok1 plus dok1 plus dok2 equals dok4 okay you got to look for that most demanding standard and then you have to come up with and understand what the answer is. So that's actually how teaching and learning for depth of knowledge starts. You need to look at the standard, you need to deconstruct it, and you need to determine the DOK level of its learning intentions and its most demanding objective to establish that ceiling of assessment. Now, teaching and learning for depth of knowledge requires four things. It has four focuses. DOK1, you're focusing on knowledge acquisition. The kids have to just give you the facts and just do it to answer correctly. The question is basically going to be who, what, where, and when, or how and why according to the text of the source, okay? 
simple DOK recall, DOK1 recall. And a DOK2, your items are still going to require the students to answer correctly, but now they have to show and share how and why to categorize and classify. This is actually from my book. Now, that's a good question, the different types of questions we can ask. So the good questions we can ask at DOK2 are analytical and reflective. How and why? How does it work? How can it be used? How is it used? How does it happen? Or how did it happen, work or use? Why does it happen? Why did it happen or use? What categorize, what classifies? When you're categorizing, classifying things, you're at a DOK2. When you're talking about what does it infer, what does it suggest, or basically what is the effect, that's a DOK2. A lot of our standards in math are either DOK1s or DOK2s. A lot of our standards in English language arts, interestingly, are DOK2s and DOK3s. Science, science, they like to say that's where DOK1 and 2 go to die, especially what we call the next generation science standards. I don't think you have those in Texas, but yours are kind of similar because they have to do be basically more STEM questions. I'm going to go into that in a little bit. DOK2 is also what I call the social emotional level. Because at a DOK2, this is where students express opinions. This is where they express feelings. This is where they express thoughts. This is where you're going to be asking them, what do you think? How do you feel? What do you believe? What is your perspective? What is your opinion? That's why I like to say DOK2 is the social emotional level, because it's about giving examples to support your feelings. Now, a DOK3 you're still asking those same kind of analytical and reflective questions, but they're a little bit deeper. And now you're also getting into hypotheticals and argumentative questions. The thing with DOK3 questions is that I don't like to use the word critical thinking. I used to like to wear like more contextual or strategic thinking or conditional thinking or what um, Anderson and Crathwell, when they revised Bloom's taxonomy, they call strategic knowledge, conditional knowledge, contextual knowledge, even self-knowledge, metacognition. This is where you're going to get more into deeper reasoning. You're going to get more into evaluations with evidence. You're going to get not do solving problems to get an answer. You're problem solving to prove why answers are valid or in val invalid. Your answers are possibilities. Every answer is possibly correct. And every answer is possibly incorrect. Your goal is to prove it. So if you want to do a DOK3 every single time, I think you remember what I said earlier, give the kids the answer and ask them, why is it correct or incorrect? What I used to do actually when I taught math was that on Fridays, I used to call them formative Fridays or flashback Fridays. I give them a, a quiz or an assessment or a test on something I taught like maybe last quarter or even last semester. And I met the kids halfway. I'd give them all the answers. I said, guys, I gave you all the answers. You have to tell me now why they're correct or incorrect. I'm encountering a lot of schools right now that are very beholden to their curriculum. They're very, teachers are very nervous to improv with their curriculum. And it's okay to improvise, okay? But to meet them halfway, I said, does your, does your uh, curriculum have an answer key? Does your math curriculum have an answer key? They said, yes. Does it explain to the, you how to get the answer? No. Good, give the kids the answer key and ask them why all those answers are correct. That's a DOK3. Your answers, their responses are going to not be so much correct or incorrect answers, but evidence and proof. This is also where you engage in deeper debate and discussion. And what's really great is the kids actually know how to understand, use their learning or see their learning this way because it is Disney show, what if? It's actually um, based on a Marvel comic where they would tell a story and said, what if this happened instead? That's a DOK3. When you're doing hypotheticals, when you ask what if, that's a DOK3. History, alternative history, what if? What if when King George got the Declaration of Independence, he said, hey, wait a minute, can we talk about this? Science, everything is a what if. Math, give them a the problem and say, what if the conditions change or what if the numbers change? English language arts, every story starts with asking, what if? That's a DOK3. So these are what you're going to be doing for a DOK3. Now, a DOK4, again, it's the same questions, but it's not the question that you ask. It's in the way that you use it. So in a DOK4, this is where the kids are going to be going deep within a subject area, going beyond the classroom, going across the curriculum, going among texts and topics. This is where you're going to be doing STEM. 
This is where you're going to be understanding how the math and science can be used to address and explain or respond to a real world scenario situation or conduct an in-depth investigation. This is where you're doing genre studies and author studies. You're reading multiple stories by the same author within the same genre. I also like to say DOK4 is about academic equity because if everybody's reading the same text, that's academic equality. Everybody has access to it. But academic equity is I get to choose the text that an author wrote or within the same genre or by the same author. And then I do a comparison of what I was assigned in class and what I chose. This is where you engage in knowledge creation. You're coming up with new ideas about what you're learning. Expeditionary learning, service learning, giving back to your community, going out into the world. Capstone projects or DOK fours. Impo wicked problems. Wicked problems are real world problems. They can't be solved. They can only be addressed, handled, settled, resolved. COVID's a wicked problem. Too many factors to solve it. You can address it, explain it, resolve it, walk away from it. Impossible projects, things that could not be done until someone had the knowledge and wherewithal to do it. We're actually witnessing the greatest impossible project right now, the Tesla. Whoever thought electric cars could happen and become affordable? That's an impossible project. Now, most importantly, because I know there's a lot of administrators on here and I know there's a lot of test coordinators and do evaluate teachers. Do not do this to your teachers. When I come in your room, I wanna see more than a DOK1 going on in there. How many of you have ever experienced that or you had an administrator say that to you or were given that requirement? And please next year, if you're going to, or right now, if DOK is your initiative, please don't go to your staff and say, DOK is our initiative and every lesson you should teach should be at a DOK3 or DOK4. You can't evaluate teachers like they're on Dancing with the Stars. Okay, they're in front of the room, they think they're doing a DOK3, the principal gives them a DOK2, the assistant principal gives them a DOK2, the instructional coach gives them a DOK1. And they probably even don't know why, or they're probably using the wheel for it. Again, depth of knowledge is four different ways students can understand and use their learning. That's determined by the standard, and it's also determined by the strengths of the students. So I like to say that DOK is the delivery and intensity of instruction depends upon the demand of the standard and the strengths of the student. Now, I want to talk a little bit about teacher goals and student expectations to sum it up. I went a little bit to it, but what I just want you to do is I'm going to do this in a way that's very allegorical and make connections with it so you can understand. At a DOK1, it's like Nike. Just do it. That's your goal, and that's the student's expectation. Just do it. At a DOK2, you're asking the students to explain. You're saying, please explain how you got that answer. And I want you to be like Aaron Burr in the, in the uh, musical Hamilton, if any of you have seen Hamilton. Your goal as a teacher is to talk less and smile more. How can addition be used to find the sum of two problems? I'll give you two plus two. Student explains it. Talk less, smile more if they got it correct. At a DOK3, Asking the question is the answer. You give them the answer. They have to use evidence to prove why it's correct or incorrect. And a DOK4, you're going beyond, most likely not only the standard, but also beyond the classroom, beyond the textbook, and the students even beyond themselves. This is how I describe your role and responsibility. These are the comparisons I make. At a DOK1, you're a teacher. What does a teacher do? teach. You give all the information. At a DOK2, you're like the director of a show, but it stars your students. You should be able to go to your students, give them an objective, give them an assignment, give them a task, and go, and action. And the students have to comprehend and communicate. They need to talk. They need to explain. The spotlight's on them. They're the star of the show. If there's dead air, you got to go cut, cut, cut. What is it? You've got your lines. What is it you don't know and understand? At a DOK3, you're a master of ceremonies. Give them a goal, give them a task, and ask them how they could basically prove that outcome, that result. And at DOK4, you're the watcher. You just sit back and you see what the students can do with it. Not only do you just sit back, but the goal in a DOK4 is the students bring it into the room. They tell you how they connect with it. They tell you the connections they make with it. Now, for the students, their role and responsibility is this. At a DOK1, they're just a student. What does a student do? Learns. Tells you what they learned. 
but a DOK2, the student becomes the teacher. Now, can they explain it? Can they explain it to someone else? Can they summarize in their own words? Summarization is a DOK2. At a DOK3, you're thinking like a disciplinarian. Mathematicians don't solve problems. They say, this is the answer, and here's why it is mathematically. They're thinking like a scientist. They're thinking like a literary critic or historian. And a DOK4, they're the expert now. You can go to them and they can give you all the knowledge on it, or they can come up with new ways to do things. Now, I know I've been talking real technical, but there's a thing I came up with DOK, and I wrote about it in actually my book. It started as a blog that actually got some popularity online. And I call it Let's Make a DOK. This is where I compare it to popular television shows. At a DOK one, you're teaching like you're on Jeopardy or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. In fact, it's funny because a game show kind of looks like a classroom. There's a podium. You stand in front of it as the host. Your students are all the contestants. You're asking questions or you're giving them clues like Alex Trebek would, and they have to answer correctly and incorrectly. At a DOK2, the teaching and learning experience is like the, the joy of painting with Bob Ross or 30-minute meals with Rachel Ray. However, that's not your show. That's your student's show. The students become the teacher. They are Bob Ross showing you how they mix up paint and they put it up there and they make a happy mountain with that. They are Rachel Ray explaining how they made that meal in 30 minutes or less using the language of cooking. The difference between this and a DOK1 is this. If you turn the sound off on these shows, they'd be DOK1s. But when you have the sound on, it's a DOK2. But that's not you. That's your student. They are the star of the show. You could have them go on their phones and record themselves and basically go and explain how they, how they do something. It's their show. Have them make YouTube videos about what they've learned. Have them make TikToks about what they've learned. That's a DOK2. At a DOK3, it's like they're on Lego Masters or Top Chef. If you ever watch those shows, they give you a goal. Top Lego Masters, build a skyscraper or a cityscape Here's your Legos. How could you do it? We're going to change the situation now. Now, how could you do it? Or Top Chef. Here's uh, these ingredients. How could you make a taco bar? Go, you got 30 minutes. I actually do this as a training for school leaders to evaluate teachers, to say, if your classroom looks like one of these shows, that's how you know the DOK level is. Or they're running for office, like a presidential debate. And what they're doing basically is they're debating and justifying it. They don't get asked, what's the Second Amendment? They ask, how does your um, idea or how does your argument defend or refute the Second Amendment? At a DOK4, the wicked problem, remember, that's kitchen nightmares. Gordon Ramsay comes in as the expert, tries to address the problem. He can't solve the problem. You can't solve the problem with these restaurants. You can only address it, handle it, sell it, or walk away, which is actually what he did once. And the restaurant actually is down by my house. It used to be there. It's not there anymore. It's called Amy's at Baker and Catering. It's The Apprentice with Martha Stewart, where you bring people together and they have to basically accomplish a task and come up with an idea and create a campaign. Or it's Shark Tank where you go on and show the innovative and inventive ways you can use to do what you've learned. That's what I call let's make a DOK. And for those of us who like pop culture, I have this analogy for you. At a DOK one, you're teaching your students to win at Jeopardy. That's it. At a DOK two, the student becomes a teacher. This is where Padawans become Jedis. This is where they go from using the force to showing and sharing how the force can be used. This is Luke Skywalker going from the Padawan or student of Yoda to the Jedi master or teacher of Rey. At a DLK3, it's like you're playing the Hunger Games. So what's the answer to the Hunger Games? Survive. Now think strategically, how could you do it? And use complex reasoning supported by evidence to justify why you chose two people to win instead of one. And a DLK4, this is where you put on your infinity gauntlet and you use all the knowledge you've acquired and developed to address a wicked problem and snap your fingers and change the universe. That's actually the way, what I tell people about the wicked problems are. Avengers Endgame, the wicked problem was this. Thanos thought the world, the universe was overpopulated. What if I just get the Infinity Gauntlet and snap my fingers and randomly make people disappear? The wicked problem in Avengers Endgame is how do we get everyone back without changing the course of the future and how do we get those infinity stones because 
he destroyed them. So that's what you tell your kids. And that's how I actually even talk to my students. I tell them, okay, my Padawans is time to become Jedis when I work with students or, all right, it's time to play the Hunger Games. Here's the outcome. Now, how could you get to that outcome? Or, all right, everyone, it's time for Jeopardy or put on your Infinity Gauntlets and snap your fingers and let's change the universe. So what exactly is depth of knowledge? It's standards-based because all grade level and content area teaching and testing starts and stops with your standard. It's your standard. It's not your curriculum. Your curriculum is your tool, your instrument to get the kids and have you help them achieve the standard. To rely on your curriculum just to go and have the kids demonstrate proficiency or thinking that your curriculum is going to basically get the kids to do it by itself is like me giving you Eddie Van Halen's guitar and saying, now go play a Van Halen song. You got to be the artist as the teacher. You got to use that instrument. You got to use your curriculum. You got to use your program to help those kids demonstrate proficiency or exceed uh, proficiency or mastery. It's socially, emotionally supportive. DOK is only going to work if all your teachers, if we all have that collective efficacy to believe that all kids can rise, reach, and go beyond to what that standard demands. And it's student responsive. We need to tier our instruction to where the students are, but we just don't stay there. We find their strengths. Stop thinking about, about what they can't do. What can they do? I actually say this to teachers. When teachers say to me, these kids can't do this, these kids can't do this, I go like this to them. I say, well, what can they do? Well, I don't know. We'll go find out and then we'll go use a DOK level to do it. You tier it to where they are and then you bring them to, through, and beyond that DOK bar. So if you have this, if you're in your class right now, I want you to take this because it's inaccurate. I want you to throw it away. And I gave you those links where you can use this as a poster because this is what DOK is. If you want to learn more about DOK, I did write a book by from Solution Tree, and this is how actually Ed Euphoria, thank you very much for this opportunity for be here and letting me present. This is what the, the book is. It's called Deconstructing Depth of Knowledge. It's available from Solution Tree. It's also available on Amazon. If you'd like to learn more about questioning for depth of knowledge, there's a chapter in that book, but this is also my book now. That's a good question. And if you'd like to keep in touch with me, please do. My webpage, I'll write it down here again, is www maverick m-a-v-r-i-k no c in maverick education.com please don't put the c in there you'll go to a web page in india because they took my website with it and also if you'd like to keep in touch with me i will give you my email as well and um if you go to my web page there's also there a little chat box where you can go and contact me through as well tara thank you and emily for having me provide this pd i'm really glad to get the message out there. And you're going to find some pushback about this, but I'm going to want you to think about this. I know my company's called Maverick after Tom Cruise, but I'm also a fan of Jerry Maguire. So when it comes to DOK, and if your leaders are not too confident about that DOK wheel, contact me. To quote Jerry Maguire, help me help you. Help me help you. Yes, Eric, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are so appreciative of the knowledge you've been able to represent for us. Um, I know I've had my gaps and misunderstandings with depth of knowledge over time. So I'm so glad that your concrete examples, especially with this closing, hearing all the big information, that technical language, and then having that nice summary at the end was super helpful for me to figure out some of the applications um, in the classroom with students and really what this feels like to engage in the teaching, learning, and assessment process with DOK. So very appreciative of you joining us and sharing this information. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. And hopefully this is a start of like a beautiful friendship. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. We're excited to partner with you. Well, everyone, as always, thank you not only for your attendance today, but for your engagement. We hope that you found something beneficial in today's topic and that you will follow up where needed um, with Eric. We'll have some in-application guidance for you with those links as well. So if you didn't catch them here this afternoon, you'll have another opportunity at the end of the week to um, look at those resources again.
thank you all for your time and we'll chat with you again soon.